On today's episode, the Chicago Blackhawks fall 3-1 to one to the Boston Bruins, but hang around due to solid performances from Arvid Soderbloom and Connor Bedard. I'll go over my full thoughts on the game and who will replace Taylor Hall on the top line. All that and plenty more right here on Locked On Blackhawks. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up, everyone? Welcome on in to another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, thank you all for making the show your very first listen here to start off your day. I'm your host, Jack Bushman. Go and give me a follow on Twitter at Jack Bushman2. Or you could also go and check out my Strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And also, just a reminder to please go and show some support if you haven't done so already. I know well over 50% of the viewers on YouTube right now aren't subscribed to the channel, and I'm really trying to boost those numbers up with the regular season already underway here. So go and smash that like button. Comment down below as to your biggest takeaway from the Blackhawks 3-1 to one loss to the Bruins, and also subscribe to Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube. Turn on those push notifications as well, and that way you'll get notified when the episode gets uploaded to YouTube each and every day. And I also need to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by FanDuel, the best place to bet on the National Hockey League. Sign up today and visit fanduel.com slash lockdown to start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. As always, thank you all for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. Obviously, I'm sure you're all well aware, a little bit of a different backdrop here on today's episode. It's because your boy is currently out in Las Vegas covering the PGA Tours Shriners Children's Open. It was a pretty chaotic day for me yesterday, travel day, spent 10 hours at the golf course obviously getting acclimated to the time change and all that was messing with me a little bit as well. So I do apologize for not getting the episode out yesterday, but it really wasn't all that feasible with the time frame and the schedule that I had yesterday, but definitely wanted to get out at least one episode while I'm out here in Las Vegas with the Blackhawks having played their second game of the NHL regular season here. And as I referenced the 82 0 perfect season is now out of the picture, Blackhawks fans. Unfortunately, as yes, they fall 3-1 to to the Boston Bruins at TD Garden in Boston for their season opener for Chicago. Of course, this was a back-to-back for them on the road to kick off their season. Game 1's in Pittsburgh against a good Penguins bunch, and then they got to go and have a quick turnaround to take on the Boston Bruins. And it was, yeah, going to be a very lofty ask for this Blackhawks team to go into TD Garden and pick up a, a win for the second of second consecutive night, excuse me, as I referenced in the preview to the episode. The Bruins probably had a little bit of a sour taste in their mouth considering how last season ended for them, getting bounced in the first round of the playoffs, losing game seven, on home ice after holding a three to one series lead. They also were, you know, the best team in regular season history and were basically unbeatable at home. Linus Olmark and that was, you know, basically it was impossible to get a puck past him all year long. So yeah, it was going to be very difficult for the Blackhawks to come in here and to pick up a victory, but they did find a way to kind of hang around and at least make things interesting right up until the end. And you got to give them credit once again for their fight and their compete level. That was kind of my biggest takeaway from the opening game against the Pittsburgh Penguins, the Blackhawks found themselves down two to nothing in that game. We've seen many times over the last few years, how ugly things could have gotten in a hurry. There felt like, you know, we had seen this story before the last two season openers against the Colorado avalanche where things kind of got out of hand there in the opening period, but Luke Richardson and his bunch, you know, stayed stayed uh committed to the task and never gave up and fought until the very end and they messed around and ended up pulling out the victory in that opener so it's great to see this team picking up a lot of fight but they did get outplayed severely by the Boston Bruins basically all night long the only reason they were truly in this game was because of Arvid Soderbloom Soderbloom I, I don't know which one it's going with people are saying Soderbloom now I'm trying to be correct about it I'm just going to start saying Soderbloom because quite frankly it's easier uh 
but he, he was easily the number one star as I'll get into uh, here in just a moment, but he was really what kept the Blackhawks in it all night long. They were severely outplayed, outchanced. The Bruins were the ones with the puck on their stick most of the night. I actually have uh, the analytics pulled up here at five on five from the end of the game, or at least I thought I did. I can find it real quick here on the channel, but yeah, a lot of numbers were lopsided in the Bruins favor. Uh, they out. So the Corsi was 64 to 39 Boston. That's shot attempts uh, at five on five. That was 64 to 39 in favor of the Bruins shots on goal at even strength were 28 to 18 Bruins. The scoring chances were 34 to 22 and the high danger chances were 12 to eight. That was actually uh, the one category that was a little bit close there. And that's mostly due to the Blackhawks getting high danger chances when Connor Bedard was on the ice and he was the number one star, number one star skater for the Blackhawks in this game last night, scores his first NHL goal, put the Blackhawks ahead one to nothing there in that first period. And what a moment that was. Bedard was buzzing right out of the gate, though, made some great reads, had a really good opportunity in tight that Olmark made a nice pad save on. And then just a couple of minutes later, uh, picks up his own rebound and tucks a beautiful wraparound for his first NHL goal. A great celebration. Uh, but he was the star for the Chicago Blackhawks last night. And as a young 18-year-old going up against a really deep Boston Bruins squad, he was the one who led the charge for this Blackhawks team. And it was really incredible to watch. But most of this Blackhawks team's success came when Connor Bedard was on the ice. They really didn't do a whole lot when the other three forward lines were out there. So um, the 18 year old is certainly showing his flashes. Congrats to the kid for getting his first NHL talk. Probably really nice to get, you know, that monkey off his shoulder. And I'm sure it was frustrating him throughout the preseason with his only goal coming uh, via an empty netter and had a great deal of chances and a lot of opportunities to get that first preseason goal and wasn't able to do so other than that empty netter in three games of action, three or four, I believe it was for him, but gets that out of the way in a second NHL game. And hopefully that just kind of uh, gets the domino effect going because it, it really felt like throughout the preseason and even based on how he's played in these first two games, it really felt like once he gets one, the waterfall effect is going to kick in and it's really going to open the door and give him that confidence. And he's not going to have to be worrying about it. You know, in these next handful of games, he can go out there and just do his thing and know what, know what he's doing is working. And I, I think everyone has to be really excited based on what we've seen from Connor Bedard through, um, through his first two NHL games, really cool moment to seeing uh, Nick Felino, who obviously he's uh, come really close with Connor Bedard and, um, has kind of taken him under his wing, which is a great leadership aspect and a big reason why we brought in a guy like Nick Foligno. Uh, they've gotten really close in, the, in their time together as teammates the last month or two. And uh, there was a picture that I posted on my, uh, not Twitter account, X account, I guess, of uh, the way that, you know, Nick Foligno was celebrating on the bench when Bedard was coming down, leading, leading the fist bump line after his first NHL goal. And I said, find you someone that enjoys your success as much as Nick Foligno enjoys Connor Bedard's. Their relationship is uh, honestly adorable so far, but yeah, really good night from Connor Bedard. I guess that can take me into my three stars from this game. I've really talked about both of them already thus far. Arvid Soderbloom from Soderbloom. I said I was going to call him Soderbloom. Arvid Soderbloom has to be my number one star because without him, the Blackhawks could have lost this one five, six to one. And it could have felt like uh, a season opener that they've had in the, in the past or uh, a game like um, we've seen against the Bruins get lopsided. Uh, he was huge. He stopped 30 of the 32 shots and he was ready to go uh, right from the first period. The Bruins came with a pretty good onslaught in that opening 20. They did take more so control in those final 40 minutes, but he was up to the challenge. And I thought he looked more stable than he did in the preseason. I talked about a lot on the show after his two or two preseason starts, I believe it was, he was getting the job done. He was being effective. The save percentage was nice. He was doing good work, but he looked a little bit scrambly out there and just it didn't look like a recipe for success throughout the course of the season against the Bruins on Wednesday night. I thought he, you know, stayed more solid and was angled properly and, and made all the saves that he needed to. And um, then some for the Blackhawks to keep them alive in this one. So Soderblom is my number one star. Connor Bedard, as I referenced, is my number one skater star. 
Uh, led the charge for the Blackhawks all night long, was the only one who found the back of the net for them, led the team with six shots on goal and a team high seven attempts. He also won 50% of his faceoffs, which is notable because I believe he went two for 13 at the dot in the opener against uh, Sidney Crosby and the Penguins. So nice to see him bounce back in that department as well. And here's kind of a, a telling stat for how much the Blackhawks struggled when Bedard wasn't on the ice. Not only did he lead the impact card, which is something that I also post after every game, uh, was the best player for the Blackhawks all night long. Um, as a young 18-year-old, like I referenced, against a deep Bruins team, it's quite impressive. But with Connor Bedard on the ice, the Blackhawks at five on five outshot the Bruins 12 to 11. And again, it's not like he's going up against the third or fourth lines. Other teams know how dangerous this kid is. In the opener, he was playing against... Um, Chris Letang and Ryan Graves a lot, or Eric Carlson and Marcus Pedersen. He saw a lot of, um, why, why am I blanking here? The Charlie McAvoy pairing. Uh, he saw the top four defensemen and played against Brad Marchand a lot in this game, who was trying to get under his skin early. Um, didn't let that rattle him clearly, but going up against really solid lines for really solid teams, Connor Bedard in the Blackhawks top line is getting the better of them. The Hawks outshot the Bruins 12 to 11 with Connor Bedard on the ice at even strength without Bedard on the ice, they got outshot 17 to six. So yeah, that's pretty telling as to uh, how much the Blackhawks struggled without the 2023 number one overall pick on the ice. And I think is even more impressive considering how much the rest of the team struggled. And you got some seasoned veterans down in those bottom lines. They couldn't find an ounce of success against this Bruins defense. Connor Bedard in that top line was able to, and I got to give a shout out to Ryan Donato. He's my third star from this one. Uh, had an assist, played really well, 18 minutes, 45 seconds of time on ice, had three shots on goal. And um, he was someone who I wasn't really sure was going to be able to keep up with Connor Bedard and have the skill, but he's looked just fine and certainly comfortable and looked really good with Taylor Hall as well before Halsey unfortunately got injured. I'll talk a little bit about that some more um, as the episode goes on. But Ryan Donato was my third star of the game. He looks like he belongs on that top line. And I got to give him a lot of credit for proving me wrong here in the early going. Now has two points in two games, scored one point in each of them. Uh, going to be interesting though, to see how the Blackhawks kind of go about things on that top line with Taylor Hall expected to be out moving forward for a little bit. All right, folks, there are my three stars from the Hawks, three to one loss to the Bruins on Wednesday. Coming up in just a moment, I will get into some of my other key takeaways from the first loss of the season. But first, I need to talk to you all about FanDuel. And uh, hockey season is here. I had football season. We were talking about that with FanDuel for quite a while. Hockey season is finally here, and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long because right now when you bet on a Stanley Cup winner you can get bonus bets every single time that they win throughout the regular season and you can use these bonus bets to bet on anything from teams money lines to the over unders to the point spreads all on an app that's safe secure and super easy to use and so far just be betting on Connor Bedard shots on goal baby it's look great four shots on goal in game one four or more shots on goal in game two I bet it both times it's gone great for me and my boys. Go and check that out on FanDuel. There's no better place to bet on the NHL than FanDuel. And if you sign up today, visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn, and you'll start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Back here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Again, please make sure to go and show some support real quick. It only takes two seconds to help me out and help me grow the show throughout the stretch of the regular season. Go and smash that like button. Comment down below, again, your biggest takeaway from the Blackhawks, three to one loss to the Bruins. And as always, subscribe to Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. All right, getting into some of my other takeaways from the Blackhawks three to one loss. I thought uh, a really big reason why they weren't able to um, knock this game up. They weren't really getting a lot of chances as I outlined without Connor Bedard on the ice, but they did get opportunities on the power play. And once again, they came up empty. And in my preview of this matchup, I talked about how big it would be for the Blackhawks man advantage to come through against a really solid defensive bunch in the Bruins. Uh, it was one of my three um, keys to success for the Blackhawks and the power play. 
They got their chances. They moved the puck well, but it's been the same story throughout the preseason and throughout the first two games, not getting the finished product. And for how much talent they have out there on the ice, and I know that's one thing, having talent out there doesn't guarantee you success on the man advantage. We see really talented teams struggle on their power plays sometimes. There's kind of no rhyme or reason to it. It just happens if you don't establish chemistry. It doesn't really matter how much talent you have out there. But the Blackhawks have been moving the puck well, and they've been getting open looks. And I like their shoot first mentality. Seth Jones has done a good job. Connor Bedard obviously is trying to rip it every time the puck's on his stick. But again, they came up empty on Wednesday night and that kind of cost them. And it would have been really big, especially with how well Arvid Soderbloom was playing in net. Um, getting a power play goal could have given them, it would have been their second goal of the game. And the Bruins third was the empty netter to seal the deal. So uh, who knows how the final outcome would have gone had they got a power play goal, but that certainly would have given them a chance and uh, given them some life, especially in those later periods where they really struggled to get anything going at five on five. It was also kind of another struggle filled night for Wyatt Kaiser, who out of all the Blackhawks young defensemen was the one that thrived the most in the preseason and the one that I mean, I, I was always a little bit higher on Alex Vlasic, but after what I saw from Kaiser in the preseason, it was like, whoa, this kid could be a stud on the back end for the Blackhawks. And he's always been someone in my top 10 prospects list, but he showed some flashes like he should have been a guy at the top in the preseason. And, you know, it, it, he's only gotten nine NHL games of action under his belt coming into this year. So there are going to be struggles with all of these guys. That's going to happen. But for how much Wyatt Kaiser has struggled in these first two games that it's just kind of taken me by surprise from how confident and how poised he was throughout the preseason. He got called for two penalties in this game uh, on Wednesday against the Bruins. One of them though, I will say was a pretty soft cross checking call um, and was also on the ice for the Bruins game winning goal where he was in a little bit of a tough spot. I will say that being in a, you know, two on one with Milan Lucic and uh, David Pasternak, the best goal scorer on the Bruins and one of the best in the NHL. It was a tough spot for him to be in, but I think he also kind of has to recognize that, Pasternak is the goal scorer there and you know you're gonna let Milan Lucic kind of rip that shot over David Pasternak you'll take your chances on Luch and he just gave David Pasternak way too much space I mentioned that I don't know if he could have gotten there anyway but there is a chance with the reach that he could have deflected that shot had he played it a little bit more properly but that wound up being the game winner for the Boston Bruins. And Kaiser only played 16 minutes and 23 seconds of time on ice, which for the second consecutive game was the second least among Blackhawks defensemen. Only Jared Tenorti played less. So definitely keep an eye on Wyatt Kaiser. It hasn't been pretty for him so far, but he does have the abilities to turn it around. We saw it all throughout the preseason. I know there's a difference between the regular season and the preseason, obviously, but um, he's still young, still only his 11th NHL game. And, uh, hoping he can bounce back here soon. But yeah, definitely keep an eye on Wyatt Kaiser and that time on ice throughout uh, the early stretch here in the season. As I talked about, you know, one of those penalties for Kaiser was kind of crap in my opinion. And the officials were a big takeaway from this game because I thought they were dreadful all night long. Um, Connor Bedard, his first NHL penalty was a tripping penalty that I couldn't believe when the official went and signaled for a trip. I was like, wait, what? I, I couldn't believe that they called that a trip. And then the soft call on Wyatt Kaiser for cross-checking. The biggest one to me was, um, well, there was the, the whole situation with Beecher with a dirty hit on Cole Gutman into the boards. That should have been a game misconduct in and alone of itself. Jason Dickinson being a good teammate and actually got a shout out from Pat McAfee. And how awesome has it been Blackhawks fans to see not only hockey on the Pat McAfee show, but Connor Bedard obviously had his interview, but McAfee gave Bedard props for his first NHL goal and also gave Jason Dickinson some props for sticking up to Cole, sticking up for Cole Gutman. And that's absolutely what he should have done in that situation. I mean, Beecher with a really dangerous, dirty hit on Cole Gutman head down into the boards in a situation like that. And I know the NHL is trying to take fighting out of the game, which I, I think is unfortunate personally, but that's for another story. But I think in a situation like that, Jason Dickinson absolutely should be able to go in there and step in for one of his guys after a dirty hit. Not only does Beecher not get a game misconduct, the Blackhawks don't go to the power play because Dickinson gets an instigator penalty and he gets the 10 minute misconduct. And with Taylor Hall out for the rest of the game, that put the Blackhawks down to 10 forwards. 
it was an absolutely atrocious call. No idea what the officials were doing all night long. And on the hit that knocked Taylor Hall out of the game, Carlo stepped up through the neutral zone. And to me, it looked like clear cut interference. Now, I understand that Carlo probably wasn't trying to make a dirty hit. And he was going, he was assuming that Taylor Hall was going to get that puck in the neutral zone. But by the time he hit him, the puck was nowhere near there, hit him a little bit high and kind of awkwardly shoulder to shoulder while Taylor Hall wasn't looking. Even Luke Richardson said after the game, that's a blindside hit that the NHL is trying to take out. No call on the ice. Taylor Hall is out for the rest of the game. I don't know what the officials were watching on Wednesday, but it, it was atrocious and both sides deserve better. There were, there were some really bad calls, mostly on the way of the Blackhawks though. I don't think it you know really mattered in the final outcome because the Bruins were the more deserving team, but the Blackhawks kind of got the shit end of the stick, if you will, by the officiating in this game on Wednesday night. Um, kind of unacceptable for a, a, t a game on national television um, that early in the season, in my opinion. Um, and, and with Taylor Hall, you know, exiting on a, nah, I don't know. It, it was it was just a really bad night for the officials and a really unfortunate one for the Blackhawks. Um, I talked about Wyatt Kaiser struggles. I got to give a shout out to Kevin Korchinski because I thought he was really solid and was maybe the Blackhawks best defenseman in this one played, played really well, led the team with five shot blocks uh, second on the team with 21 minutes and 48 seconds of time on ice. That's the second consecutive game. Now that uh, he's played more than his line mate Connor or his defensive partner, Connor Murphy looks like the Blackhawks are really giving Kevin Korchinski every opportunity to prove himself and um, to kind of uh, make that decision for the coaching staff himself. And I'll tell you what, through two games, I think he's here to stay. And again, I don't think there's a wrong decision in this matter, but Kevin Korchinski's abilities, they're, they're unique. They're undeniable. And the Blackhawks could use more of them on the back end. There's just not a ton of speed there other than Wyatt Kaiser and Seth Jones having a third defenseman and Korchinski is the best skater of the bunch. Having that game breaking speed is really needed. And that's the game the Blackhawks are trying to play more of that high paced tempo style. You've seen with the draft picks that they've made these last few years. They've gone after a lot of players that have speed. So wouldn't be surprised to see Kevin Korchinski stick around based off these first two games. Obviously he's got six or seven to go before that make, before they make that decision, but he's got my thumbs up as of right now. Um, the bottom six for the second consecutive game did not really come through in terms of uh, scoring chances. I know the, the veteran line came through in the clutch and I, I thought they did play well. I thought Felino was huge though on the penalty kill. Perry was really good on the power play. They came through obviously for that late goal. I want to give them a lot of credit, but in terms of the analytics, they weren't all particularly that good in the first game. And then the second, the whole bottom six really, really got uh, outchanced and dominated. And it's kind of a, a flash of what could be for this Blackhawks offense. If things aren't going well now, they were going up against a very solid Boston Bruins defense. That is something to consider here, but it could be foreshadowing a, a, an offensive struggle that we see from the bottom six, because when you think about it at the same point in time, Boris Kachuk, Cole Gutman, still guys that are trying to prove themselves. And there isn't a whole lot of speed on that veteran line, but um, they really didn't add all that much in this game. And it just kind of shows that I think they need to make an impact for this Blackhawks offense to be turning as a whole. Connor Bedard can do the heavy lifting, but the second line, Lucas Reichel, they still have another gear to take it to the bottom six chipping in, I think is going to be really key element for this Blackhawks team. And they just didn't find success at all in this game against the Boston Bruins. Um, and I also got a, one thing that I think we have to take with a grain of salt early on in the season, Blackhawks fans is be wary of the good goaltending. And I've talked about the Blackhawks compete level. And I do think that's going to translate all throughout the season. And they are going to be very competitive in a lot of games, but do you all remember early on in the year last season where the Blackhawks were, 6-4 now, I think it might have been through their first 10 games. And everyone was like, well, this Blackhawks team might be a lot more competitive than we think. And they still ended up being dog water. I do wonder if that could be happening with this Blackhawks team early, because when you get good goaltending, that's what you have in this league. You have a chance to go up against any team and you'll have an opportunity to keep things competitive when you get star, when you get top tier level goaltending. And that's what the Blackhawks have gotten out of Peter Morazic and Arvid Soderblom in their first two games. Is that going to be the case all season long? I, I probably doubt it. More so for Peter Morazic, who's just shown a bunch of inconsistencies all throughout his career, and for Arvid Soderblom. I know the Blackhawks have a lot of confidence in him, but this is still his rookie NHL season, and 
there are times where he's, he's going to be put in tough spots and I'm sure he's going to have his struggles. That's just part of being a, a young netminder. So could this Blackhawks team be competitive all season long? I do believe that all ultimately with, you know, the mindset that they've just come into the season with and the approach and the confidence that they play with as a bunch behind Luke Richardson. Yeah. I do think they can be competitive, but for those out there saying, Oh, well, this Blackhawks team hung in there against the Bruins, they beat the Penguins. Maybe they surprised some folks and maybe they are a playoff team. I would hold my whole horses there. Be wary of solid goaltending. I do still think, like I've said many times, this Blackhawks team is probably a bottom 10 bunch in the NHL, but they're scrappy. They'll show a lot of heart and they'll fight. Um, but if they don't get good goaltending, I think they're going to be losing a lot of games still this season. All right, folks, there are my full takeaways from the Blackhawks. First loss of the 2023-2024 season coming up in just a moment. I will get into Taylor Hall's injury and what that means for the top line in Connor Bedard. But first, I need to talk to you all about Sleeper. The NHL season is finally here. Will the Vegas Golden Knights reign supreme once again? I love NHL hockey, and I know all of you do out there as well. And that's why I want to tell you about Sleeper. Sleeper is my go-to platform for daily fantasy sports, especially fantasy hockey. Because with Sleeper, you have the chance to win 100 times your cash on daily fantasy hockey. And the NHL has literally never been more exciting with stars like Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Alex Ovechkin, Sidney Crosby, Kale McCarr, Connor Bedard. And all you have to do is simply select more or less based on the stats listed, such as goals, assists, points, saves, and more. And Sleeper offers 100 times your payout. So start paying attention, make the correct picks, and you could win real big. And I think we just got to keep riding whatever they give us on Connor Bedard. I mean, seems to be leading the charge at a young age for the Blackhawks. And I think he's only going to be gaining more and more confidence as he racks up that experience. He's had a big first two NHL games. Entries can be made real quick in under 30 seconds. And Sleeper is live in 28 plus states. And right now you can also use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL and you'll get up to an $100 match on your first deposit. Again, that's Lockdown NHL in all caps. And go and see Sleeper's Terms of Use for more details right now. Segment three, Taylor Hall, as I mentioned earlier, did leave the game early last night, uh, or on Wednesday night, excuse me, in his return to Boston, which was unfortunate, along with Nick Felino. Both of them got a little bit of a tribute video and a, a round of applause from the crowd, which is, you know, a cool part of hockey when, you know, all other players go back and visit their former cities. I love to see the respect and the appreciation that both the teams and the fan base give them. And it was really unfortunate that Nick Foligno, or Nick Foligno, that Taylor Hall had to leave this game early because not only was it his return to Boston, but he was really buzzing early for the Blackhawks on that top line with Connor Bedard and Ryan Donato. And then as I outlined a bad hit, from Brandon Carlo that should have been called for interference in my opinion is uh, what did it. They went shoulder to shoulder, kind of just an awkward looking hit. Taylor Hall went back to the locker room immediately. He actually did return to the Blackhawks bench momentarily, but then did not join them after the second intermission. And that's when the Blackhawks ultimately ruled him out for the rest of the game. But with Taylor Hall out, we kind of got a little bit of a flash of what the Blackhawks could be going with on their top line. Taylor Hall seems like it's going to be a week-to-week -week injury for him at this point in time, so I'd assume he's going to be out for uh, the final three games of this five-game road trip to kick off the season. We saw the Blackhawks go with Connor Bedard, Ryan Donato, and Andreas Athanasiu, interestingly enough, as the first trio, but then late in the game, Luke Richardson loaded up with Lucas Reichel, Connor Bedard and Andreas Athanasiu. And one thing I've talked about throughout the offseason was how much wiggle room was Luke Richardson going to give not only the youngsters down the middle, but also how long was he going to wait before he loads up with Lucas Reichel and Connor Bedard on the top line, especially when Reichel found most of his success in the NHL late last season while playing on the wing. I was curious as to how long Richardson was going to wait. And I know this was just kind of a situation, not only with Taylor Hall being injured, but also late in the game, you're trying to load up and get that game time goal. You want to put your stars and your best players together, obviously. But I do wonder if that's something that we could see with Taylor Hall out because the second line of Tyler Johnson, Lucas Reichel, and Taylor Radish thought they were okay. They were the second best line for the Blackhawks on Wednesday against Boston, but that's really not saying all that much. Again, the top line did 
basically everything at five on five. I do wonder if Luke Richardson is going to go with Lucas Reichel, uh, Connor Bedard, and Ryan Donato, or if he's going to go with Andreas Athanasiu as the right wing. I do ultimately think that Ryan Donato has played well enough to be deserving of keeping that spot. Do you put Andreas Athanasiu on the left wing? I think that's probably the top choice at this point in time because you do still want to develop a second consistent scoring threat. And that was one of my biggest things that the Blackhawks needed to establish this year. They wanted their offense to take that next step. Lucas Reichel in that second line being a consistent scoring threat would really help them accomplish that. And we just haven't seen it through two games. I know that's a really small sample size, but um, I, I do think Luke Richardson does want to keep Lucas Reichel at the center position and away from Connor Bedard right now, just so they can establish a little more depth in their lineup. So for me personally, I think on Saturday against Montreal, we're going to see Andreas Athanasiu, Connor Bedard, and Ryan Donato on the top line to open things up. The other option, maybe you bump Tyler Johnson up there or Taylor Radish and try to switch things up on the second line because that hasn't really been working yet either. Um, one way or another, though, I, I do think Andreas Athanasiu is the right guy to get this opportunity. He's, you know, has the wheels and the speed to keep up with Connor Bedard. And um, out, out of all the guys throughout the rest of the lineup, I, I do think he makes the most sense aside from Lucas Reichel. So that would kind of be my expectation for when the Blackhawks are up in Montreal taking on the Canadians tomorrow. Andreas Athanasiu, Connor Bedard, and Ryan Donato, to me, is what we'll see as the top line. All right. I think that is going to wrap up today's episode of Locked On Blackhawks. As always, thank you all again for tuning into the show and be sure to go and follow Locked On Blackhawks for free right now, wherever you may be listening to your podcast and to go and subscribe to Locked On Blackhawks on YouTube. And that way you can get the latest episode as soon as it comes available each and every day. As always, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can go and find me out on Twitter at Jack Bushman2, or you can go check out my Strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. So until the next episode, everyone out there, enjoy your weekend. And thanks again for listening to the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.